Hey, welcome to Aaron Interviews Dan, the Hello. show. That's I'm pretty sure that's not what it's called, but... It's, grump on grump action. That's definitely not what it's called. Grumps find grumps love. Uh, I was joking with Susie when um, when Vernon told us who would be interviewing who. Yeah. And he said, like, you interview me. I was like, oh, finally. I get to fucking sit on a couch and talk to Aaron for a little... <laughs> What a fucking unique dream come true this is. Well, I don't know which episode this is, but, um, so this podcast is just gonna be, I'm going to interview Dan. Yes. About his life before the, Game Grumps. Life before Game Grumps, yeah. Of which there was a lot. Really? Game, I mean, I was 34 when I joined Game Grumps. Shh, get the fuck right out of Isn't town. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. I'm, How old are you now? I'm 37. How old am I? I think you're 28. Well, let's start from the beginning. <laughs> You popped out of a womb. <laughs> Your mom and dad fucked. <laughs> so what was that like? Was it traumatic? It was all right. As I recall. Uh, What's your first memory? My first memory. Jeez. There, there are a couple. What, one, one I definitely remember sitting like the public library in my little town in Jersey that I grew up in had like a story time thing. And it had like this little like depression area with like stairs that go down and then like a flat area. Uh, for kids and it was all encased by like this dark black glass and I just remember like l sitting on those little stairs and listening to the to the librarian tell stories and I was like this is fucking awesome um I don't even think awesome was a thing that people said back then but like I knew what it was <laughs> and I knew that the library had it <laughs> you thought exactly this is fucking awesome yeah so as that, a three-year-old that's one thing I also remember like the other earliest memory there used to be this place called the Union Market um, where like uh, it was just like a flea market like a dirty flea market on a Jersey highway and I remember like looking at this like tapestry like this red carpet tapestry thing that was like hanging from the ceiling and um, I think I think Your Wildest Dreams by the Moody Blues was playing like over the speaker because I remember that. Hmm. And like, but that's, that's very, I don't know. I, I remember, I remember that early childhood in like snapshots, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's, it's not so much like things that I remember just like certain moments, but those moments are like crystal clear. It's really weird. Yeah, definitely. And pl well, plus like. I bet if you went back in time and watched yourself, it wouldn't even be anything like what you remember. I'm sure. It's just like you keep recalling that memory and it just keeps like iterating more and more on it. Yeah. And also because like when you're a little kid like that, you so much is in your head, you know, mm. like there's no lens of logic that you're seeing the world through. So like anything like alligators could be behind this couch because fucking of course they could. That just the way you physically see the world must be so different, but you kind of forget, you know, as time goes on. So what was it like living with your parents as a kid? I loved it. Like my mom is incredibly sweet and awesome. Uh, my dad worked a lot. Uh, but when he was around, we had a great time together. Like we, we watched, uh, Giants games a lot, the New York Giants. Um, we were, uh, my dad was a big football fan at the time. And that was the first thing like we bonded, uh, to each other with. And like, I, I can remember like him, I think I've told you about this, like he would try to uh, hide the curses, like when the Giants would blow it, he'd be like, ah, oh, shucks, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it was really funny, um, and uh, yeah, I had, I, I have a younger sister, Dana, and so it was always just the four of us, and then my grandparents, Granny Sexbang, and mm. her husband, who I called Pop, Bernie. Uh, you called her Granny Sex, that's her given name. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I called her mom, actually. Because oh, that's right. Yeah, because I mean, some people know this, but like, I call my parents Debbie and Avi their first names because I just taught myself how to talk. So like, I called people by what I heard. Yeah. Um, and what I heard was my parents by their first names, and then when my mom would refer to her mom, my grandma, she would call her mom. So my right. grandma became mom, and my grandpa became pop, and the other half of my family, my dad's side, was all in Israel. So. I liked them, uh, but I didn't see them very much. Did you ever go to Israel when you were a kid? Yeah, yeah, a bunch of times. Um, I, the biggest one that I remember is, I mean, I, I I have pictures of myself in Jerusalem when it was like a safer place to be, like our, the whole family there. And like you see like the, the golden domed mosque in the background. It's really cool, really cool place. Um yeah, and that's when I went to the Qumran caves. Oh, that's and, right. Yeah, and and lied and told everyone that I dug those. I didn't. I didn't. Even though there was some wiki graffiti 
after are I mentioned that. Are you sure? Because I'm I'm pretty sure I read that. A- am I am I am I sure that I didn't at four years old dig up uh two thousand year old caves? Yeah, I'm I'm sure. Were you like convinced that people were like, oh my god, really? Well, as a kid, you just don't think you don't have any sense of logic, you know? <laughs> so you don't think anyone's gonna call you on bullshit because you know, you just don't have that like perspective yet. Yeah. Uh, but the, the biggest trip to Israel was, uh, when I was 13 for my bar mitzvah, I got bar mitzvah in Israel, which was a very big deal. And, um, I remember like, I'm in like this old temple and just surrounded by like the most orthodox of orthodox Jews. Mm. And like the, it was, it was, it was like my first performance really as I as I can recall like outside of like school plays and stuff and like that's why when we got in front of the magfest crowd and there was like 5000 people like uh I think you asked me you were like dude are you nervous and I was like not at fucking all cuz nothing will ever be scarier or more intimidating than being 13 and having to sing like holy <laughs> hebrew scripture <laughs> to like these like fucking old like Hasidic dudes who are like sitting on um, like, I don't know if they're pews or what you'd call them, but they're balcony seats and they're looking down at you and like, you're this like American kid that doesn't speak Hebrew. (laughs) And they're just like, you can see like, they're like, why did they bring this kid into this temple? And like, they didn't know I could sing, you know, like, and I did really well because like my mom helped me prepare for that for months. And uh, so it was just you. It's just me. Yeah. That's what a bar mitzvah is. Like, you sing a section of the Torah, which is the Hebrew Bible, essentially. Wow. Yeah, very intense. And I don't know what I'm singing, you know, I just, and I can still remember like the first lines. It started like, and like that times a thousand. Um, and uh, yeah, I did it. And at the end, they threw candy at me, which is like um, the tradition. So you have like a sweet life. And my granddad, my granddad on my Israeli side was, you know, I, he died when I was, I guess, 15. And like, I only saw him a handful of times, but that was the one time I could really feel that like, he loved me and he was like proud of me. Cause like that he was a Holocaust survivor. Wow. Yeah. So for him to like come from that, which was like, you know, a time when like they thought like the Jewish people would die as a whole to having a grandson on the other side of the world come and to Israel, a country that didn't exist at the time. It was only set up after World War II, so the Jews would have like a safe haven. And uh, for for that son, for that grandson to be interested enough in the culture to like do that, it was super meaningful to him. Wow. Yeah, crazy, right? Was that Was that at all associated with, like what was the moment where you sort of realized that you liked music or doing music the the second i mean as for as long as i have memories i um i loved music like there's pictures of um of me like at 2 years old with uh at my grandparents house granny sexbank's house with like giant headphones on and like it's like 1982 so like the headphones have like those big like telephone curly cords you know to uh to the stereo system. I love that shit. Me too. Me too. I loved it. And like the the fucking headphones were just encasing my head, you know. <laughs> um but like I adored music from from the moment uh I heard it, you know, which must have been always. Um I remember something I mean I had CDs and I I I listened to songs and I got them stuck in my head all the time. I remember when Nevermind by Nirvana came out. Mm-hmm. That was the first time that I was like holy shit, I'm going to start collecting music, you Mm. know, like I'm going to, anything that sounds like this, I'm going to buy the CD and listen to the whole thing. How old were you? Uh, Nevermind came out in 1991. So I guess I was 12. Mm. Um, and CDs were kind of a new thing at that time. Uh, so I, I think I had a bunch of things on cassette. I definitely had Def Leppard on cassette. Um, Spin Doctors on cassette. It's, it's funny to think of that now. Um, Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, and they were all warped eventually, but like getting into Nirvana led me to Pearl Jam and Soundgarden and Alice in Chains and that whole group. And then 
there was a comic book store I used to go to in New Jersey called One Flight Up. And uh, there's this guy who worked there named Keith. And he was like, this is my favorite band, bro. You got to check them out. And that was Rush. Mm. And and that was 1992, I guess. I was 13. And then, then it was just like, no question, like, this is my favorite band. Like, and they have been for the next, you know, 25 years almost. Yeah, seriously. And, uh, and, and like from that point on, I was like, this is all I want to do. I never want to do anything but this. So when did you start singing? Started singing at five, I guess. Um, like there's still, um, like little school drawings, like from me in kindergarten where it's like, what do you want to do when you grow up? And this little stick figure with the words like la 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 coming out of his mouth mm-hmm. and shit. Um, I started singing seriously when I was seven. Um, and I guess when I was like eight or nine. What does seriously mean? Uh, just every day, like mm. an hour, um, just going for it. Uh, no like training or anything really. But when I was eight or nine, uh, I was recruited into this thing called the American Boy Choir. Uh, which was they would have taken me out of school and I would have been like part of this choir that just travels around the world. Wow. Yeah. And, um, but I was, I didn't want to do it. I was scared. I was mostly, (laughs) I liked girls. Like that really was it. Like I had a crush on this girl uh, in like second or third grade. And I was like, I can't leave this school, you know, I'll, I'll never get to be with her. <laughs> you know, how so funny to think about that. Did it ever happen? Uh, no, but we, we, we're still friends actually. Really? Yeah. She lives in the Texas area. And, uh, whenever I go to RTX, we hang out for a couple hours. That's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's super neat. Um, and, uh, that made me realize like, oh shit, I really could do this, uh, for a living. Um, but at the time, I was so wrapped up in just being a kid, you mm. know, I just want to ride bikes and walk through forests and look at comics and video games and all that stuff. So it wasn't until probably college that I was like, I hate what I'm doing right now. Why am I not in a band? Mm. You know, and and it's funny, too, because for years after that, I thought like I was behind, you know, I was like, shit, Rush already put out like five albums, Kurt Cobain did never mind when he was 23 yeah you know um and then he was dead by 27 i'm like what am i doing (laughs) you know i could be dead right now (laughs) so so what were you doing in college that you hated uh i went to school for advertising because um my high school guidance counselor at the like when i was younger i didn't have a sense of that i could control my own life Mm -hmm. you know like I don't want to say like, I really respect the fact that you dropped out of high school, but like, I respect the fact that you felt capable of making your own choices at that age. Whereas like, I very much felt like adults control my life Mm. and like, I get to have fun, but I have to do what they say. Yeah. So if my parents say you have to go to college, uh, then I have to do it and I have to finish it. And, um, but what made you choose that field specifically? Advertising? Yeah. It, it was literally, um, I had to figure out something that wasn't music because mm-hmm. my parents wouldn't, uh, support that. Really? <sighs> my mom would have, but my dad, uh, would have been like, you need something that will create a job with like a base income. Right. Stuff like that. Um, and, and also I had a lot to live up to in my family. Like my granddad, you know, uh, invented the body electrode with, um, with his partner, Dick Berman, um, like those sticky pads that attach electrodes to your body, you know? What? I didn't know that. You didn't know this? No. Yeah, dude. Um, he invented those and, uh, I mean, saved somewhere between millions and billions of lives. You know, that's, they're in every hospital room. Um, so there was a lot to live up to, uh, in my eyes and no, no one in my family ever said like, you have to change the world or anything like that. But like, I felt it. And my uncle is a radiologist. There's just a lot of smart sciencey people. Right. And I wanted to go into the arts. Um, and, uh, I felt like I'd be letting people down or like I'd be fucking up their legacy, you Mm -hmm. know? Um, if, if I became a singer and then, but then it, it, it just dawned on me one day in college, like, Oh, 
the reason I went into advertising was simply because my guidance counselor was like, well, you're creative, so why not do advertising? That's a creative field. And meanwhile, it's fucking not <laughs> at, at all. <laughs> like they tell you what to do. And like, if you get too creative, they fucking rein you in. And really, I, sh- I mean, I'm sure every client is different, but like, you know, you know, my sense of humor, right. you think that's going to fucking sell Prell or like, you know, or like, I don't know, it, so many, like or re- a real estate company or anything like that. Yeah. I probably could. Maybe. If they're cool, yeah. <laughs> you're, but you're at the mercy of whoever hires you, right? And I never wanted to be at the mercy of a client, and so I finished college begrudgingly. But I, I had all kinds of other challenges to deal with in college, as mm-hmm. you know. Like that's when my OCD was in full swing, and I was very physically ill for a while. But now I look back and I'm like, that physical illness was probably tied to like depression and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but. I started to get better um, junior year because I just, I went to France. I went to Israel again. Um, I just started traveling a lot and um, made me realize the world is much bigger than I thought it was. And like the problems that I felt like were so huge and enveloping can fucking just be left behind in another country, you yeah. know? And um, so then as soon as I graduated, I had this newfound sense of like, well, I have a degree that I worked for um, that I'm never going to do anything with, but I also survived a bunch of fucking trials. So now I've, in my own mind, I've quote unquote, like earned the right to pursue music. I see. And um, then as soon as I uh, graduated, I, I moved, I lived with my parents for a couple of months and then I moved down to Philly and started a band. And I've been in bands ever since. Wow. It's 15 years ago. So when was, sorry to skip backwards. No, it's fine. When was uh, paleontology in your life? That was when I was a little kid. Um, that was the other thing I loved because dinosaurs were so fascinating to yeah. me. Um, but it's, you know, it's like, it's much more glamorous in your head when you're a little kid. Right. Like paleontology and like, because you think it's going to bring you closer to dinosaurs, <laughs> you know? But dinosaurs are gone, man. Yeah. Like I can get all the, personally, I can get all the thrill of dinosaur bones just by fucking walking into a museum and seeing them there, right. you know? Plus like, I also realize that I don't have actively working sweat glands, you know? Mm. Like, so fucking hunching over in the deserts of Utah for, <laughs> you know, hours at a time in the searing desert sun probably wouldn't have been the uh, safest career choice for right. me. Um, but I did adore dinosaurs. I've always been that way in the sense that like I'll find one subject and like obsessively like research it and learn about it. And like um, I was that way with uh, dinosaurs and, you know, later like fantasy sci-fi stuff. And, you know, we're all kind of that way. Yeah. Like as I sit in a room surrounded by your toys of all your interests, <laughs> like it's really... Like we, we, we exhaustively explore stuff that we love. Yeah. So that was, was the paleontology different from, uh, the Egyptology? Yeah. Yeah. Egyptology came later when I was in college, but again, like it was the kind of thing that I loved it. Like it was so interesting to me, but I just could not, uh, it didn't feel creative enough. Right. You know, and and that's always been my personal issue with like science and math um like if there's one answer like somebody else can find it mm. you know like but if you're creative and or in your you're the you're in the arts you're doing something totally unique that like you know there's a million answers and no one can do it quite like you can you know um so i became drawn to things where i could like really you know pour the weirdness of my brain like into it like that's what my sister said uh when she first saw the ninja sex party videos she was like this is like watching your brain explode onto a a screen for three minutes and because she spent all that time with me growing up and like so many of the things that end up in nsp songs are the same things that i either was interested or was always joking about Mm. um uh like unicorns and dragons and karate and all that shit. So what was the first band? The first band I was in, well, there were a lot of, there were a lot of 
false starts. Okay. The very first band I was in was when I was 15, and we were called Vacuum because we sucked. <laughs> <laughs> is that actually the reason? That is absolutely the reason. <laughs> but, but like, we had no idea what we were doing, and, like, I was into prog rock, you know? Mm -hmm. um, like, which is the most, like, technically insane type of music and right. we did not fucking have any kind of talent like that to pull that shit off did you play an instrument i played bass mm -hmm. yeah and guitar a little bit but i never really was very good at instruments because i didn't have you know i was born being able to sing right you know so having to starting on a new instrument that you suck at was very frustrating right right um there that i sucked at uh so then i was in I was in a bunch of bands uh, in college, or right after college. There was one called the New York Fuzz. There was <laughs> one, yeah, just like very like Radiohead influenced stuff. The first band that really took was called the Northern Hughes, and um, that was the band that I moved to Philly for. Uh, it was a I answered a was it a Craigslist ad? It was some kind of it was some kind of classified ad of uh these guys aaron and jeff and they were two guitarists and they were looking for a singer mm. and um that was the first uh that was another time kind of like you know how we've talked about how so much of my life now can be traced back to the first time you ever wrote brian and i right. like that one email that answering that Craigslist ad was another one of those moments. Like mm. it led me to move to Philly, uh, which led to my entire life path after that. Wow. Um, but you know, Aaron and Jeff, uh, they were good guitarists, uh, but they very inexperienced with like writing songs and stuff. Mm -hmm. So the three of us would like go over to Aaron's parents' basement, um, in Edison, New Jersey and play music. Um, you know, objectively looking back, we weren't very good, but it was thrilling because a I smoked a lot of weed at the time. Mm -hmm. So like, and when you're smoking weed, you can like imagine stuff. Mm -hmm. It like gets your imagination going a lot. So even though like it just felt like three guys, even though it was just three guys in a basement playing, just dicking around, kind of, it felt like I could see the VH1 behind the music. You know, like. 30 years from now, like the, they started with humble beginnings yeah. in Edison, New Jersey, like that kind of thing. But like, then there, like his, Aaron's dad would like walk through the middle of our practice and be like, I got to get the antifreeze from the garage, <laughs> you know, like, and we were like, oh, we got to get out of here. So then we moved to Philly. Um, and we probably should have moved to New York because that's a much bigger talent pool, much more like if you're serious, you're moving there. Right. But like it was, it was after 9-11. So New York was like a scary place to be. Mm -hmm. Like no one knew what was going to happen. This was like 2002. Wow. That was right after. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and Philly, even though I hadn't really been there that much, it felt like a very safe, like starter city. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it's, it's like a, it's like a big small town. Right. Um sort of like the Seattle of Grunge Rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh man, I learned so much, you know, um cuz we found other musicians there and we eventually became a six-piece band and there was wow. yeah, there was lots of there were lots of variation uh, varied degrees of talent in the band, mm -hmm. you know, and there was friction in the personalities and stuff like that. Um and that was exhausting because I had to play like peacekeeper a lot, and, right. like all these weird politics and stuff. Um, so it ended maybe three years later. Um, and I remember crying my eyes out just because like, you know, it's like what you breaking up with someone who you know is not right for you ultimately, but like you still think like maybe it'll work if these things change, right. you know, but then like when it's over, it's like the finality of like, fuck, that's all it was, you know? Yeah. Um, so I was very bummed at the time, but, you know, I started that band in that, we were playing with those guys when I was 22. Mm -hmm. And by the time we broke up, I was 26. Wow. So, yeah. So, um, in that time I had learned what it was like to play live shows, what it was like to record an EP, yeah. um, the demands of like trying to be a musician full time, like 
the very serious financial um, consequences of not having a steady day job mm-hmm. and all that. Um, just re- real struggles, but like, and also like it was kind of the first time I'd ever lived on my own. Because even, even with college, like you're in dorms and like right. things are set up for you. I came... I came out of Philadelphia a much more adult person than I went into it. Sure. You know? And, um, so the, the experience was very, very good for me. Um, and then I moved back up to New York to Brooklyn, um, and then met Peter Lennox and we started Sky Hill together Mm. and Sky Hill seemed like, uh, a much more, um, a much better situation for me because, uh, Pete and I got along great. Mm. There's only two people in the band, you know, like, and at that point I enjoyed assembling music in the studio more than I liked playing live. Okay. You know, um, now I like them both, but that was definitely, um, a big step forward because it was more in lines with the music that I wanted to play. Yeah. Did you feel like it was sort of more intimate? Much more intimate. And like, you know, if there's six people in a group, like, unless everyone's in lockstep with each other, um, musically and mentally, uh, and emotionally, like it's very hard. You're only, I can't, I'm not good at math. You're only like 15 (laughs) to 20% of the band, you know? Uh And like your ideas are only going to go so far before someone's like, eh, like even the name, the Northern Hughes, I, I don't think anyone really loved that name, right? but like, it was just endless debates on what we should be called, you know, and, uh, to get six people to decide on anything, you know? Mm. So like Northern Hughes was just kind of like the compromise right. of, of everything. Um, and so Sky Hill was much more like, wow, I'm getting 50, I'm getting all of my ideas out. Right. And so is Pete. And it was, we made an album that was very satisfying to us. Um, and we were very proud of it. And I kind of, I kind of had this feeling of like, see dad see like i can do this you know i'm right and i was a better singer at that point because i'd been working at it for so long by then um but we just couldn't get anybody to listen you know Hmm. like the internet uh, youtube had just come out but we didn't know anything about it It was a very strange time for music as it still is because the industry was sort of collapsing in on itself Hmm. like no one was buying cds everyone was downloading music for free but still but YouTube hadn't been developed really as a way to get your music out there. Right. You know? Um, so it was just very hard to get anyone to listen. And I kept a list of everyone I personally like gave CDs to, Mm -hmm. like I would travel around the country to like shows and hang out afterwards and meet bands and just give them the CD. But it, it was always, it always felt like I was begging. Right. You know, which is a very like gross way to feel when you're meeting people. Um, even though I was proud of the CD, but like, I still have the notebook at home of like, I'd write down the name of someone I gave and it's just like a notebook filled. And like, it probably took a a thousand, a thousand CDs got out there. And I was like, this is amazing. A thousand CDs are out there, you know? Wow. And, um, but then we split up because Pete was just, Pete was a little bit older than I was and he just didn't love doing it. Um, if there wasn't going to be, uh, I shouldn't say a financial reward to it, but kind of, you yeah, know? no, like, totally. And, and I just remember him asking me like, what's the end game here? And I was like, that was such a heartbreaking thing to hear. Cause yeah. I was like, uh, what do you mean? Like we do another album and we keep working hard and then it'll catch on eventually, you know, but I didn't have a plan. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so that split up. I'm sorry. I, I feel like I'm just like yammering about my entire like history and not letting you ask any questions. Should I just keep going? Well, I mean, that's what this is about. Oh, that's a really good fucking point. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so that was 2008 that we broke up and that was as, that was as painful as any like relationship with a girl breakup mm-hmm. that I'd ever had at that point. Um, And so I kind of like stepped away from music for a little bit and was it like tumultuous? Did you like not get along with him afterwards or no, no, it was, it was fine. It, 
we didn't talk a lot after that, but mm-hmm. I think it's just, it wasn't necessarily because we didn't like each other or I was mad at him or anything like that. You know, we just had our separate lives mm-hmm. and like Sky Hill was the thing we did together. Right. You know, so when that wasn't there, there was no, no connecting thread. Um, and so then I didn't know what to do. I felt like I didn't just, I felt like a failure. I really felt like a failure. I was 29 and I, I remember like 30 was looming and I was like, wow, I'm 29. And that's when those thoughts of like Kurt Cobain had changed the world by yeah. now, all Jim Morrison, like all these 29 was getting less and less to be a sexy rock star age, you know? You're right. And it was scary. It was really scary. So, um, I was like, why don't I take a step back and, um, take a year where I just try to join established bands. Um, and so I just took bands that had like instrumental songs and sang, made up lyrics and sang vocals over them. That's where that zero seven track that I played for you one time came from that rat a tat track. Mm, yeah. yeah. That was all during that that year where I was just like, and I would go to their concerts and hand deliver it to them and they'd say thank you and then nothing would happen and mm. that would be it. Um, except Zero Seven, who I did become friends with actually. Oh, that, cool. That was cool. Um, and in the meantime, I started going, uh, doing comedy stuff at Upright Citizens Brigade in New York. And that felt good too, um, just because like there was no pressure to it. Mm. It wasn't like, I'm going to change the world doing this. Um, and then two things happened right in a row. Flight of the Concords came out on HBO. I don't know if you've ever seen that show. No. It's really fucking great and funny. Um, that I saw Tenacious D live. Wow. And yeah. And I just, it, it, it just clicked for me that like, holy shit, like comedy music can actually be really fucking good music, you yeah. know? Um, and so as I went up the ranks in that comedy school and like up in classes and stuff, I started to think like, I wonder if I could find someone to do this type of comedy music with. So I put out a classified ad, which went nowhere. And then I asked my friend Julie if she knew anyone and she knew Brian. She had just worked with Brian randomly because he was working that circuit, like playing um, music for musical improv comedians. And Brian and I met and we started Ninja Sex Party and uh, everything from that moment on was totally different than ev- than all other musical experiences I'd had or creative experiences of any kind. Because mm. with the other ones, it always felt like I was pushing a stone up a hill. But with Ninja Sex Party, right from the beginning, it had its own momentum. Like Brian was like an immediate best friend, you know? Um, and it just felt like, like I'm, I'm good at two things, you know? <laughs> Playing video games is not one of them. <laughs> uh, I'm good at singing and I'm good at comedy, mm-hmm. you know, and to suddenly be able to use both of those things in a project gave me such a sense of power because I was like, holy shit, now I can really like carve out an artistic corner in the world, you mm-hmm. know, and do something really unusual. Cause like most, most good musicians aren't funny mm-hmm. and most good comedians aren't that great at their instruments, you know? That's just generally the way it works. They're definite huge exceptions. Um, But it was like this niche, you know? And Lonely Island had come out, and that gave us the idea to start doing YouTube videos because those guys are fucking brilliant. Um, And that's kind of what got the ball rolling. And, like, it always felt like, holy shit, this could work, you Mm -hmm. know? And um, the second... The second video we put out was called The Decision, and um, and Donald Glover, uh, who's a very funny guy, who was also in the, he was like, I think I might have told you this before, like he was like the senior class at UCB when I was a freshman, mm-hmm. so to speak, and um, he uh, he found that video and like uh, put it out there, like retweeted it or whatever, um, or put it on his blog, and it got like something like 7,000 or 8,000 views on YouTube. And I just remember like wanting to cry because I was like, holy shit, a thing, people like a thing I did, Mm -hmm. you know? And it could, it could do things. Um, 
I remember, uh, do you want to date my avatar by Felicia day mm -hmm. and the guild crew that had come out and that had like 7 million views at the time. And I was like, Oh my God, 7 million views. Like think of what my life would be if, if something I did had that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and it happened. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fucking crazy. Um, but at the time I was mostly just really excited to be, um, respected in the little comedy community I was mm. in, you know, like that meant a lot because there were a lot of really funny, talented people there. And after, after four years of the Northern Hughes, two years of Sky Hill, and then a year of just being rejected by these bands that I was trying to, um, join, uh, that's a lot of, I mean, none of those things were failures, but like, that's a lot of not success yeah. the way you dream it, you know? So to finally have something that, um, was clicking with people felt amazing. And then, and then Ross caught wind of it, you know, and you saw it and then you reached out to us and then we became friends and things just built and built from there. And then, um, and then when you asked me to join Game Grumps, uh, I had a sense that that could be like the ultimate break. Um, well, before that was Starbomb. Oh yeah, yeah. That's well, true. the inception of Starbomb. Right, right. right. Well, it, yeah. It felt like it felt like the break was coming. Yeah. No matter what, but Game Grumps already had like a million subscribers. You know, so it felt like instead of building something from the ground floor, like holy shit. Um, I, I can be part of something that's already amazing, mm. you know? And, uh, I mean, it was scary at the time as, you know, as we're on record saying that those were scary times, mm -hmm. um, just because I felt like, you know, if, if I blow this, uh, all my friends are out of a job, you know? And like all my friends, artistic careers will suffer because Game Grumps brings so much attention to the stuff that they do individually. Yeah. You know? So, uh, it was intense, but like by that point I was like, I was 34, you know, and I'd, I'd been kicked around a lot, you know, and, um, I'd, I'd been working on my voice and my comedy for many, many, many years, you know? And, uh, so without realizing it, I'd become like a cagey veteran of like a lot of these things. Like I had a lot of improv comedy training. Mm -hmm. So sitting down with you to play video games was easier than that because you and I have like a natural chemistry and, um, with improv, the hardest thing for me was always coming up with something out of nothing, Yeah, you know, but with game grumps, with that format, like whenever you felt like you were running out of crazy shit to say, there's something visual to just play off of. Right. You're constantly getting like new material that you can think of. Um, and just since then, like my life has gotten so much better, you know? Um, it just feels like I feel so happy in LA. Um, and New York will always be like the city that I grew up around and grew up going to. And it'll always be my favorite. Um, and I loved Philly. Philly is where I, I really found a lot of myself, but I don't think there's a place that's given me more than LA, mm. you know, like in such a short time too. And even just like the fucking weather here, you know, like people joke about it all the time. They're like, oh, the weather's so good. That shit changes your mood, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Like to wake up and walk out and it's a beautiful sunny day every day. Like it's, it's a really incredible thing. And, um, I don't know. I feel considering this place is 3000 miles from what I always considered my home. Mm -hmm. I feel very at home here, which is really cool. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's more or less the, the, the arc of my career, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's like a J curve basically. <laughs> it's, it's like just fucking 13 years of nothing. And then four years of an insane rocket to the stars, you know? That's awesome. Yeah. Th well, thank you. Well, thank you for providing the opportunity. Yeah. Well, you did it all yourself. So it's, 
it's a team effort. We've all, we've all helped each other a lot. And like, you know, the camaraderie I feel with, with you guys, um, is something I didn't have in my previous, uh, bands and artistic ventures, you know, mm. not of course counting Ninja Brian cause he's a brother too. And he's part of our crew now too, yeah. you know? So it really like, as soon as, as soon as that happened, then I was like, wow, the fucking circle is complete now. Yeah. Like there's just nothing, there's nothing stopping us. Like, cause so, so much of, so much of being successful in life is getting out of your own way. Yeah. You know? And now we've just got a really like tight knit group of people that look out for each other and it's, it's really nice. That's great, man. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing your story. Holy shit. Yeah. That, that was super fun. <laughs> yeah. Good. Um, glad. yeah. And that's on record now. And, uh, God, I didn't even get into like girls and romance and travel and man, there's just so many angles to life, you yeah. know? like really important things, but you know what? Well, maybe we'll come at it later. Yeah. That's, it's a 45 minute podcast. So fuck it. You know, I <laughs> like gotta, gotta just explore one subject. The gay, the grump on grump podcast. Fuck it. You know, <laughs> <laughs> this is fun. I'm glad we did this. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, I hope you guys check out the other episodes of each one is a different grump interviewing a different grump about their life before grumps. Yeah. Um, we, we've all had very different lives yeah. to bring us to the same point. Yeah. Very strange. It, but all Vernon's idea. So give him love on Twitter if you like the podcast. Yeah. Vernon's the best. Um, yeah. I forgot, to, I forgot to even mention how I worked at Maker yeah. here when I first moved. And that's where I met Vernon. Um, we sat in a little pod next to each other. I was like, this dude's brilliant. I still have your first email you sent out for... Anna Monster? Yeah. Oh my God. Like, Hi everybody, I'm the new guy, Dan Avedan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is wacky. <laughs> oh God. They, I mean, like, they were... I guarantee that email was not 100% me. Because <laughs> every, every email that I wrote had to go through like five people and they were like, change this line, this line, this line. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh cool, so make it not funny and douchey? They're like, yep. Well, I, that was inside voice. I didn't say that to them, <laughs> but, but like, it's, it's funny to, to, to do YouTube stuff that feels so free mm -hmm. after like my first exposure to like the real business side of YouTube was in a place that was very corporate, Yeah, you know, but like under the guise of not corporate, but extremely corporate. Yeah. Yeah. But I had fun there too. There are a lot of nice people at Maker. So it's... Everything, everything happens for a reason, but I did quit maker to do game grumps <laughs> and I remember getting a fucking, like they, they gave me a standing O on my way out. Like everyone applauded and I was like, this fucking, this is awesome. It's like an eighties movie uh, <laughs> just cause they were all so happy for me. And they, they could see like, you know, fucking dreams were coming true. Yeah. So it's, it was awesome. That's great, man. Rock and roll. All right. Well, we will see you. Um, if you haven't heard it yet there's one of these where i'll i interview Susie, and uh who 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 uh who's interviewing you brian Ooh, yeah so he, most recent grump interviews yeah OG longest grump. tenure yeah. longest tenured grump he's gonna ask some biting fucking questions <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of hard we'll truth we'll see <laughs> cool we'll see you later everybody all right bye